In this lecture, we're going to discuss reaction mechanisms. Specifically, we're going to define a reaction mechanism and show how reaction mechanisms can be used to determine the rate equation for a reaction. We'll start with a definition. So a mechanism is a step-by-step -step description of how bonds break and are formed in a reaction. And by step-by-step, -step, I mean that if all the bonds and that are broken and that are formed, if that happens in, in an, at the same time, that would be a single step. You may have reactions where some bonds are broken and some are formed uh, sequentially. So you might have more than one step. And so a reaction mechanism specifies how that happens. An important thing, important aspect of reaction mechanisms is that if you have the mechanism, you can uh, determine the rate equation. So the rate equation can be derived from the mechanism. It's important to note that this is a one-ray relationship. If you have the mechanism, you can determine the rate equation, but it's not necessarily true that you could get the mechanism from this, the rate equation, because there's more than one mechanism normally that could give the same rate equation. So if you have the mechanism, you can get the rate equation. So rather than talk about this at a theoretical level, let's look at concrete examples. So let's contrast two reactions that use two different mechanisms. And as a consequence, we're going to see uh, some uh, how we can get their rate equations. So we're going to this in the context of a chemical mystery, which is why these two reactions have different rate equations. So if we look at this reaction, we've got bromomethane over here on the left and we've got hydroxide and in the background we hear beautiful music playing which i thought would be relaxing we're going to add this to all our podcasts in the future enjoy we have two different reactions with different rate equations the reactions are very similar. In both cases we have a hydrocarbon, an alkyl group, and that alkyl group is bonded to a bromine atom and it's being attacked by a hydroxide ion. So we can see in these reactions we're going to knock off the bromine and replace it with the hydroxide turning the alkyl halide into an alcohol. So here we we form methanol in the lower reaction. We have uh, four carbons. This is called a T-butyl group. And the T-butyl group is going to be attacked by the hydroxide, knock off the bromide, and we end up with T-butyl alcohol and a bromide. So very, very similar reactions, but we notice the top reaction is second order overall. It's first order in each of the reactants. And the bottom reaction is first order. So it's first order in alkyl halide, and it's 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 a zeroth order in uh, in the uh, in the hydroxide. And normally, when something's zeroth order, we don't even show it since it doesn't have any effect on the rate. Okay. So why are these different? The reason they're different is their mechanism is different. So I want to show you each of these mechanisms, uh, one after the other. So it will give you a flavor of how to explore a mechanism and how to get the rate equation from the mechanism. So let's start with the top reaction. So in the reaction mechanism, we show exactly what's happening at every point in time and how the bonds are broken and made. So here we have our first reaction. It's, it's got a name, the SN2 reaction. The name's not important, but it's just the one where the top reaction from the previous slide. So we've got an alkyl bromide. And so bromine's on the right-hand side of the periodic table. It's a fairly electronegative atom. So it's going to make this bond polar. And so the carbon is going to have a slight positive charge on it since the bromine is more electronegative. So here we have 
hydroxide, which has a negative charge on it. So it's going to be attracted towards that carbon. You can show that pair of electrons extending to form a bond with this carbon. Now we know carbon can only accommodate four bonds, so if we start to form a bond here, we're going to have to break a bond, and we break the bond to the bromide. So we're going to, this goes from being a bonding pair to a non-bonding pair, and so we'll go ahead and show that this already has three non-bonding pairs, and one of those is, we're going to get a fourth, and so we're going to form a, a, a bromide ion. Okay, so this is how the bond forming and bond breaking occurs. And so we can imagine drawing a, uh, the products from that. We're going to have the hydroxide came in on the back. We still have our hydrogens. And we pushed off a bromide. And it's important when we do these mechanisms to specify whether or not things happen in a concerted matter or sequentially. So in this case, it turns out that this happens in a single step. So the two, this bond is formed and this bond are broken at the same time. All right, now how does this tie into the rate equation? If we look at this, we can see that we have in this single step, we have a hydroxide ion. We have a hydroxide ion and a, uh, the alkyl bromide in the same step. So we call this a bimolecular step. So we have a single step, and that single ste step is bimolecular because we have two things in banging into each other to do this reaction. So if you have a bimolecular step, it is going to be second order. It's going to be first order in each of the things in the step. So we can say that this single step is going to have a rate that's equal to the rate constant for that step, Let's say k step just to emphasize that, times the concentration of hydroxide times the concentration of our alkyl bromide. In this case, it's bromomethane. So notice that although we cannot do this just by looking at the overall reaction, we can do this if we have a mechanism. If we have a mechanism, we can look at each step, and for a step, we can write the rate equation. So uh, you can write a rate equation for a, for a step in a mechanism by inspection, by looking and saying, how many molecules do I have over here? That's going to be the order in that molecule. And how many molecules do I have here? That's going to be the order here. So since I have one hydroxide, I'm first order in hydroxide. I have one bromomethane, I'm first order in bromomethane. Then you just look at the reactants in this step. Okay, now notice something. This whole reaction is just a single step. And so for a single step reaction, the rate equation for the step is the same as the rate equation for the overall reaction because this, the reaction is just made of a single step. So we can just say, that is the rate equation overall. So it's K times concentration of hydroxide times concentration of our, of our methyl bromide. So the IUPAC name for this is bromomethane, but it's also called methyl bromide. So those are, those are synonyms. Okay, so we've got, the, we've got our rate equation here and we can see that we're bimolecular. And by the way, that's what the 2 and SN2 stands for. So it just means substitution, nucleophilic, uh, 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 bimolecular. So that's what the 2 is. So we have substitution because we're substituting off the, brom the bromine atom and putting in a hydroxide in its place. Nucleophilic, we just call this a nucleophile, the hydroxide, because it's looking to bond up with some positive charge since it's got negative charge. And the nucleus of this carbon atom is a nice place that's full of positive charge. So that's why it's called a nucleophile. Okay, that's not the main emphasis here. The main emphasis is being able to look at the mechanism and get this rate equation. So make sure you would be able to, if you're given a single step reaction, derive the rate equation from that, from that mechanism, once you're given the mechanism. Okay, so we see this one should be second order. Let's go back and look at the other reaction and see if it is different. 
The second example reaction goes by a completely different mechanism called the SN1 reaction mechanism. And in this mechanism, we see that we've got the same sort of reactant, an alkyl uh, bromide and a hydroxide, but this sort of backside attack that we showed in the previous reaction, that's not going to work here. If you build a space filling model on uh, WebMO or, or some other uh, program, you'll see that these methyl groups are really bulky and there's no space for this to come in and attack the backside of this molecule and then knock out the bromide. So it just can't work that way. So these, these bulky alkyl halides undergo substitution by a completely different mechanism. What happens here is that we break this bond in a first step. So we'll go ahead and label the steps. So we break this bond, we can say we're turning a bonding pair into a non-bonding pair, so we're going to end up with a, putting a negative charge on the bromide. But we're also going to be putting a positive charge on this carbon. We're going to form what we call a carbocation. So we've still got a methyl group here, a methyl group here, a methyl group here, but this central carbon only has three bonds on it, which is why it has a formal charge. And as you might imagine, this is not a stable molecule. This is going to be very reactive because we've got charge on a carbon. And it's going to react with something with a negative charge. And we can see we have something with a negative charge sitting right there in a reaction mixture. So in the second step, we're going to have our carbocation. Oops, there's not a bond there. We're going to have our carbocation react with our nucleophile, in this case, the hydroxide ion. So we'll draw it out completely with our lone pairs here to show that one of those lone pairs is going to reach out and form a bond with that carbon atom. And that's going to give us our product, our t-butyl alcohol. Okay, so notice that the overall reaction is a substitution where we've taken off the bromide and put on the hydroxide to make a uh, to make an alcohol but that it occurs in two separate steps and that has a big impact on the kinetics if we look at this we can see that we've got uh, I'll give you the case for this step that the, it turns out and we'll explain in a future lecture why this is so if we call this k1 and k2 so we'll put these up here to emphasize that this is the rate constant for an elementary step. Elementary steps and mechanistic steps are synonyms. So this is two mechanistic steps or two elementary steps in the mechanism. Okay, so we've got these rate constants for these individual steps. And if we compare them, it turns out that the first K is really, really small. And so let's draw that a little more neatly. So if we were to compare the sizes of these, we'd see that K1 is much smaller than, than K2. And we'll explain in a future lecture when we look at what happens when we have sequential mechanisms like this. If you have a first step where the K is small, that is going to control the speed of the reaction. So it's sort of like going to an amusement park and saying, how long does it take to get through a ride? where first you have to wait in line. So how long it takes to get to the ride is a function of two things. You've got to wait in line, that's your first step, and then you've got to go on the ride, that's the second step. The second step is really fast. And so the main thing that determines how long, whether it takes you five minutes or an hour to get through the ride is that first slow step. Because as soon as that first step is over, the second step happens right away. So when we have what we call a, a slow, fast mechanism like this, this first step, we call it the rate determining step. So the rate determining step is also called the rate limiting step. Those are synonyms. So when we have a rate determining step, we can discard all the steps after it. Not before, but all the ones after that we can discard which means we can write the rate equation for this reaction pretty easily. We're going to say that K 
1 times the concentration of methyl bromide is going to be our rate. And let's look at this a little more carefully here. We can see we had hydroxide. It wasn't doing anything. We can, we can put it on the right-hand side, too, to emphasize that it's a spectator ion. We could circle the molecules that are actually doing anything. And we can see that first step, there's just one molecule that's undergoing reaction. The other one's just, just sitting there. So that one stands for the word unimolecular. So this is substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. So before we saw the SN2, now we're seeing the SN1. And because the rate determining step or the rate limiting step is unimolecular, the rate equation for the overall reaction is going to be first order. The molecularity has to match the order for each step. So notice that the overall theme we have here is that we can determine the mechanism. If we have the mechanism, we can determine the rate equation. We can't get the rate equation just by looking at the overall reaction. Both of these reactions looked the same. Let's go back and look at them. Both of these reactions have a hydroxide attacking an alkyl bromide. And we couldn't tell just by looking at the left-hand side of this slide that one of these reactions was going to be second order overall and one was going to be first order overall. For that, we needed the mechanisms. So from the mechanisms, we can determine the rate equation for the reaction. In a future lecture, we're going to look at why some steps are slow and some are fast as we continue to explore mechanisms.